Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 366 for Tuesday, December 6th, 2022. <music> Greetings, folks. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab. Welcome back to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. New sponsor for us tonight, that is rocketmoney.com slash gig gab. That's where you're going to go uh, to get rid of all your useless subscriptions. It's actually a really cool thing. It used to be called Truebill. We'll talk more about it a little bit here. For now, back here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. I'm Paul Kent in Napomo, California. How are things in Napomo, my friend? Um, how are things? It's that weird time where uh, the outdoor gigs are ho- trying to hold on, but the weather is every day, you know, questionable if we can squeak out another weekend of this stuff. Yeah. So it's it's that time where a lot of gigs get canceled. You know, it's, it's an interesting thing. Right. I don't know how most people handle it about whether they have guarantees if something gets canceled. I mean, I'd like to think that, you know, you'd say, listen, this is my income. So I, you know. I'm there to play, uh, you know, put me inside if it's raining outside. But I, I would imagine, I'm guessing around here, most people most people have a handshake agreement. And if a gig gets canceled because of weather, it's done. And they're just like, well, all right, everybody, everybody loses today. Right. Yeah, I think I think certainly around here, that's generally how it is. We've got a couple of clubs that have like outdoor clubs, like um, this one in Port, uh, Portsmouth called the Gaslight. They have a whole tiered system of payment uh, where it's, it, they'll call you, if the weather is questionable, they will make a decision by 3 p.m. on the day of an evening gig. I'm, I'm assuming if it's an afternoon gig that, you know, back that up some number of hours, but essentially early enough that you wouldn't have left your house. Uh, that, you know, by 3 p.m., they'll let you yeah. know if it's on or off. If they say yes at 3 p.m., they're in for at least 50%. And then... I mean, if they say yes, if, if it's like a 7 or 8 o'clock gig and you get there and then correct. something has happened. Yeah. So, but, yep. So, they're in for 50%. Small. If you get there, you check in with them. Do you want us to set up? Like, does it look like it's a go? Yes, it's a go. As soon as they say that, now they're in for 100%. You it, Once you start, you know, once you confirm with them that everything's still good when you get there... Uh, then, you know, you st- obviously start unloading your, your crap and put it on the stage and, you know, do the, the routine that we all know at, at once you're doing that, they've agreed to pay you a hundred percent, even if the thing gets canceled before you ever play a note of music. So, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, at least like that's fine, but still you could wake up that morning or at two thirty PM that day, get the phone call. Hey, it's pouring gigs off. We don't owe you anything. And that's all in the contract. Like this, this, there's no surprises to this, but it does mean that your income is subject to the whims of the weather. And I guess just, it is, is what it is. If you choose yeah. to play at an outdoor, you know, place that's outdoors, you are opting into the possibilities that cancellation could happen. Yeah. And if they're at, you know, if the venue actually says, here's our plan for it and you, you opt into it. You can't complain about that. No, no, it's totally right. That's it. (laughs) Yes. Everyone is participating willingly, full knowledge, right? You know, like, and and, yeah, there's nothing to complain about. If you don't like it, don't say yes up front. It's, I mean, it's really easy to say, yeah, no, that doesn't work for me. They'll be like, okay, like, (laughs) you know, what else are you going to (laughs) say? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have an interesting thing to bounce off you. So I have, I I know somebody who uh, is playing some original music. Okay. And um, he four walls his events. And he's done, I think, three in six months, right? Okay, sure. And um, if you had, if you were asked to help, help out a fellow musician, but you were concerned, you were, you were concerned about the the attendance. Would you would you refer people to go? And would you refer 
a venue. I, I'm being a little obtuse here. Yeah, I understand. So, yeah, when you say concerned about the attendance, do you mean concerned that there wouldn't be enough attendance? Is that the that's the concern? Just to be clear. Yeah, and I guess the, the kind of the the bigger overarching thing is how careful do you think you need to be with referrals to something that you're concerned is that like, do you think it's going to come back on you? Right. Like, Hey, I I recommend this, this show and you go and it's, you know, no one there. And and actually I I know I'm being obtuse. Let me back up. So part of this is, is your perspective on things versus reality. So I did a little two question poll on the house rockers Facebook page. Yep. And the, the two questions were one, are you, are there too many musician plugging their gig posts on your timeline? I saw that post. Yep. 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 And the second question was, are you, um, is Facebook your main place to go for, for finding out about music? Yeah. And what I was looking to validate or, 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 or disprove was, you know, yes, I'm getting tired of all these musician things. I mean, I get it. You're playing. If I want to find you, I'll go find you. And was curious how many people look at musicians' websites. Overwhelmingly, slam dunk without even a hint of looking over my shoulder. About 100 people replied, so pretty good represent. You know, Yeah. No problem with all the music stuff. It's way better than the politics stuff. Keep posting your gigs. <laughs> yeah. And and yes, Facebook is the main place I go to find out about music. So at least in, in the Bay Area, this group of people who responded were just slam dunk. And again, what it did, did to me was, uh, you know, I had to check myself because my assumption that I thought was going to be validated was like, yes, there's too much too many people pimping their gigs and yeah. you know it's getting to be an irritation. That's what I thought was going to happen. And I, you know, was completely wrong, completely wrong about that. So now I'm holding this up to, you know, a friend of mine did a gig. Well, let's wait, and- let's let, I, I want to come back to your friend, but I want to talk about what you just said here, because I, I found this poll interesting. It made me realize something about myself. I saw, I, I saw your poll and I answered something along the lines of what evidently mm-hmm. is part of the majority. But I was surprised that I was answering that, too, and answering it in that way. I had not thought much about it, but clearly, and this is, I would say, a change. It's certainly a change. It's probably one that has happened over the last year. It's certainly different than pre-COVID. Uh, Pre-COVID, I would have said, oh, no, 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 no. Like, I, I hate, like, there's the gig stuff on Facebook is not valuable to me. It's it's noise, right? All of that stuff. But now it is the primary way that I find out when bands are playing. And, and I don't just mean friends bands, but I certainly include that in that list. I also mean any band. It Like, it is my news stream for that kind of stuff. If I am not intentionally following a band via some other means. Like, you know, there's some bands that I'm, I'm on their email list and I actually tell my, my, like my email filters to, to float that stuff to the top. I want to know about this band or that band or whatever. But other than that, pretty much any music I go out to see, I'm finding out about on Facebook and I'm, and I'm enjoying seeing that. I don't go to every show that I, that I learn about. Of course, I, you know, there's only seven days in the week. But, uh, but I like it, it is a hundred percent different than I would have, than I sort of thought in my head that it was when I saw your question, it was like, Oh, wait, I, I really like this. This is valuable to me. I wouldn't, if, if this went away, I would, I would choose to replace it with some other means of finding out about gigs. And I found that interesting. It was, you know, it was a revelation sort of, I mean, it was a, the same revelation you had, but, but from, you know, a different perspective, like it, it, I, I learned that about myself that I was like, oh no, this is a great way to find out about when any bands are playing. It's great. Yeah. And, and, you know, I guess the thing is, is you're coupling, well, you're decoupling. So I would assume more people say, no, 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 I'm a fan of this band. I go check their website all the time. Nope. No, I mean, and maybe it's because the social part of it, along with just the calendar postings, right? Again, I might and the convenience was, of it. It's how just numbing is this, right? I'm playing here. I'm yeah. playing here. I'm playing here. Like yeah. I see it, and I'm numb to it. I'm like, I get it. 
You know, you're playing three times a week. I get it. You're playing 20 times a month. I, you know, I, I thought it would be numbing to people, turning off people. Right. But clearly they're like, no, I'd rather hear where my friends are playing. It's, you know, no, I can, I can mute it if I want. Although I don't think most people know how to mute things. Um, but they're like, no, this is pleasant to me. It's just, it's just a little tidbit of news that floats by on my timeline. Yeah. And that's all good. And, you know, I find that, I find that really, I I'm, find it valuable. I'm surprised that I'm in the majority. I, I guess. I mean, I, I was surprised. You're that never I was. in the majority. No, I know. <laughs> You're a contrarian. I am a contrarian. I, but it, like I found, I like I read through the comments. It was like, oh, I'm not alone here. That's interesting to me. I'm rarely do yeah. I find myself in that scenario. But yeah, and again, I you know, the last several shows I've been dissing on Facebook, and you know, it's know. awful. Same. You have to, yeah, you know, terrible. game the system in order to get to your people, and and you know, it it. It still feels icky to me, but I guess the people have spoken. I guess, the, I mean, it was emphatic. I actually, of the over 100 responses, I don't think there was one that says, yes, I am tired of the noise, which is really what I thought would happen. And now, now, to be fair, this was a post on Facebook from a band page, right? From the House Rockers page. So, and Facebook's algorithm, we can, we can hate on it all that we want and, and, and it deserves it. To a degree, but it is also very good at showing you things that you are going to engage with. So it's entirely possible that Facebook is, I, do we have this conversation? I can't, I can't remember anymore what, what I say on what podcast, but I've, I've, I recently was ranting. I think it was on business brain, but it might've been here too, that of all the algorithms out there, I think TikToks is the best because and and my reason for saying that, and it's I know it's crazy to say that you know the Chinese algorithm is the Chinese effectively the Chinese government's algorithm is the best one, but their algorithm is is it prioritizes my joy, right? It shows me things that make me happy that I engage mm. with. Whereas for the longest time, Facebook's algorithm was showing us things, and maybe it still is. I, you know, I don't I don't want to say that it's changed, but for me, it has changed. But for for the longest time, it, you know, it was trying to show me things that would infuriate me, and there, therefore, I would engage with them, right? And and I think you know that that's sort of the the expectation, the understanding of Facebook's algorithm. But they've gotten a lot of crap for that, so maybe that's changed. And and where I'm going with this is, it's entirely possible that the people who think that it is noise, Facebook's figured out that they think that it is noise and they didn't even show them your post huh. so that they could tell you it was noise. That's interesting. The only thing I, I don't know, I but counter that with is I probably personally know as house record fans, 40 to 50% of the people who, who responded. Sure. The, the people I know come to a lot of house record yeah. gigs. Yeah. Yeah. So the combination of the perspectives of those I know and those I don't know matching up together was, was informative to me. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I don't know. But That's it actually crazy. makes me, makes, you know, makes me wonder what the value of my website is. You know, I haven't even looked at traffic on the house rockers website in quite a while. Huh? Uh, I still think you need to have a website. Like I, it, Facebook is a fantastic discovery platform right now. However, we know that it like we just had a conversation about how that's a, a, a surprise to us. That's new. Well, let's be careful about this. It's a it's a fantastic discovery platform for people probably over a certain age who follow a certain type of music. Fair. I don't think you're, you're following your favorite hip hop artist or your favorite DJ on Facebook. F fair. Totally fair and correct. I would agree with that. Yeah. But, it, you know, let's let's just say for the sake of argument that. It is a fantastic live music discovery platform for some segment of the population today. Mm -hmm. Will it always be that? Can you always rely on that? No, you got to own your own home out there. Right. And, and, uh, and so having a website, I think is super important. A website is the place where you want to be able to control how people see and, and buy your merchandise, how people, you know, if, if people do want to find your calendar, if somebody finds your band and wants to nerd out about you create as much as you can for them to do that, because that that's sense. your opportunity to, you know, somebody sees you at a show 
you, you might have one shot to like hook them and anything you can put out there on the internet where they can dig deep and wait, what, who was that guitar player? What? Oh, interesting. Oh, I've seen another band that that guy plays in fascinating. Oh, I like this. Now they have things to tell their friends about your band, right? Like, I think that stuff is, is more important than it gets airplay for, although we're giving, well, let's just also. drill down on this a little bit, right? So yeah. I've had a house rockers, Twitter account for quite a while. Yep. And I don't, do much with it but i also notice that what i when i did do stuff with it it didn't get much play sure and then i don't get a lot of house rocker mentions yep. so just passively watching twitter doesn't seem to be a lot i have a house rockers instagram account it's okay you okay. know i think there might be about a thousand people if you know 800 to a thousand people sure. and you know which is not nothing um and my assumption is again now now revealing that I'm bad at assumptions. My <laughs> assumption is that it's similar to the people on Facebook who have guilty feelings about being on Facebook sure. and would really like to be on another social media platform, but they really can't divorce themselves entirely. Right? Yes. So you know, several of the people in my poll said, yes, Facebook and Instagram. A couple of mine have said TikTok, but but more I mean, definitely yeah. Instagram popped out more. I can say so, I know that you know, Instagram, Instagram lives in this kind of weird place. Right? Yep, Instagram's its own thing that's owned by Facebook, of course. But uh, it, you know, it is it is a different platform for sure. It's got a different. You engage with it differently. The demographic of the users over there is is different. I, of course, there's plenty of overlap, but but certainly it's yeah, it's a different thing. Yeah, it's fascinating to me. Uh, yeah. Huh, folks, let us know. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. How are you? What are your thoughts on this? What are you finding for your bands? What are you finding just for yourself? Like, are you, I would say that I am going to see more local live music and I, I, these days, and I think it's because I'm seeing it on Facebook and that like to even to say those words, even if those words are wrong, it feels that way to me. And it's, it's fascinating. That 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 it actually works because I don't know three months ago six months ago you and I sat here and said it's a waste of time posting your gigs on Facebook blah 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 well not a waste of time I the more point was you're 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 participating in a system that's working against you actively mm. I mean, it, that, right. that was more my it wasn't yeah. so much as a waste of time it was more like I felt bad you know continuing to ply a platform that played such awful games with me and my fan base. Right. Yeah. So that yeah. people sign up to see me and it's a mystery as to whether they will see me or not that I have to pay to, you know, access my own fans, um, you know, and that, you know, they, they offer a feature, they take away a feature, you know, it just was, right. a, you know, constant shell game of how to be successful on Facebook. That stuff just ticks me off. And almost as more of a moral stand, I was be like, you know, this, this is awful. You know, it's awful. Yeah. It's, it's, it's better now, but, but it's still, they're still playing the shell game that, you know, are they just baiting us in? And then in six months, we're going to be back here saying yeah. those people, man, I mean, like, whole, you know, <laughs> invite to events who gets to see events. Yeah. You know, the, the, the whole event platform just is, is awful, awful. Yeah. You know, you think it's free advertising. Oh, that no, you control no. your destiny, in no, it, but no. it's far from that. No. Right. No, it's not. And, it, and it's all, it feels like it's just literally designed to give you a a hint of success so that you pay to get ultimate success. And maybe maybe that's what they're doing. But it, it sure, like, I'm going to pay more attention now to the the things that I see to figure out if they're sponsored or not. I, I think the majority of them are not. And that. That's interesting to me, but I'll, I'll, I'll report back. I, I, um, I just came back from like, literally just a couple hours ago, got, got home from being in New York for a couple of days. We were down there for my son's 21st birthday and hanging out. And I, I saw some cool things and I learned some things, Paul. So I want to, I want to talk about that. The next thing that I want to talk about though, if, uh, if the timing works for you, Mr. Kent is our sponsor. Please do. All right. Hey, have you ever noticed how hard it is to cancel a freaking subscription? Like this should be easy, but some companies make it really difficult. Like last year, I wanted to cancel our Wall Street Journal subscription. We didn't need it anymore. I sold the website that we used it for. 
and I didn't need it anymore. I, there was no way online to do this. That's why I love using our sponsor, Rocket Money, formerly known as Truebill, because they're able to do this for you. The app shows you all your subscriptions in one place and then cancels for you whatever you don't still want. Rocket Money can even find subscriptions you didn't know you were paying for. You might even find out you've been double charged for a subscription. To cancel a subscription, all you do is press cancel and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. Like I said, I did this. And I'm sure I would have had to get on the phone and go through probably, you know, one of those phone trees. It would have been an hour, right? At best, a half hour of my time. No, I clicked and it was done. Get rid of useless subscriptions with Rocket Money now. Go to rocketmoney.com slash giggab. Seriously, it could save you hundreds per year. That's rocketmoney.com slash giggab. Cancel your unnecessary subscriptions right now at rocketmoney.com slash giggab. And our thanks to Rocket Money for doing what they do and for sponsoring this episode. All right. Um, wait, 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 I just have to say one thing. Yeah, man. Those people at Rocket Money are doing God's work. I agree with this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You ain't you ain't kidding about that. That's true. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's good stuff. It is good stuff. Um, so on on Sunday, we drove down to New York, went to a comedy club. We went to it was one of the one of the comedy sellers rooms. It was the fat black pussycat uh over there in the village. And we got out of there at like 10, 15 and I was like, all right, well, where are we going to go next? And I looked across the street and there's the blue note and a uh, famous jazz club for people who don't know that. And Lisa was like, maybe we should go over there for a drink. I'm like, ah, I don't think that's how that works. Uh, you know, they've got shows every night and I'm like, but I'm looking online. It's like, oh crap, Bill Frizzell's there. The eight thirty show was sold out. Okay, fine. Well, that was also over. We go up to the, Guy at the door, we're like, is there, you know, is there room for the 1030 show starting in like 10 minutes? And he's like, yeah, like, great. So we bought tickets, sat down at a table, ordered a drink, Bill Frizzell, three other fantastic musicians walked out, played a set for 75 minutes or something. It was amazing. Uh, the, the things that can happen in New York, uh, you know, if you keep your eyes open, is, 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 is wonderful. The next night, uh, I had posted online about this, you know, that we were heading down to New York and uh, asking people, you know, what's going on this weekend. And my friend, Andy, uh, Andy Buslovich, who uh, is a guitar player. I've played a bunch of theater gigs with him here in New Hampshire over the last, I don't know, four or five years about, um, I would say sometime mid 2020, uh, he wound up moving back to New York and he, he was, working very hard while he was here in New Hampshire to put together a career for himself as a pit musician. And really like I, I encountered his frustration with this, you know, where there just wasn't enough money on the table to make this work. And the frustration, I didn't quite understand it because I knew what pit musicians get paid around here. Uh, you know, it's, it's anywhere from like 50 bucks a service a service being either a show or a rehearsal to maybe a hundred and a quarter a service, the top end, maybe 150 a service. And, uh, and you know, he, but I didn't quite understand. He was like, yeah, just, it's just not working. It's not working. Well, he had previously lived in Manhattan and worked as a sub for a variety of shows. The one that I knew the most about was he was a, a sub a regular sub for rock of ages and uh, so he commented on my post. He's like, you know, what you should do is get staff rate tickets to Wicked from your friend Andy and go see the show. And so we did that. Uh, we did that last night, which is weird that they had a show on a Monday night, but I guess they're doing these during um, the holiday season or whatever. Great show. I'd never seen Wicked before. I I, I knew roughly what the story was, but uh, didn't quite know it. Uh, fully it's it's a fantastic show there's no wonder it's been running mm -hmm. 19 years or whatever right? you know uh but it was really we wound up having dinner with him he did not play last night's show uh but 
uh, so we had dinner with him and then we went to see the show and he went home. Uh, but it was, it was interesting cause I knew he was playing a bunch. Like I thought he was the, the, you know, the, the house guitar player, the, 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 you know, the chair holder, if you would, the person that's, that's named as the guitarist for, uh, for wicked, but he's not. I'm like, okay, well, how, how's this work? He says, well, the guy who has it is like in his sixties and he he plays you know enough of the shows but he's also because of the way the musicians union works there it's the uh the local 802 i think i want to say i might be wrong about that but i don't think i am the the union puts all this stuff together so that musicians get uh access to a pension and of course their their rates are very well defined and prescribed and it's a really good gig uh but that pension is sort of the key. And he said, usually by the time you get to be a chairholder like this guy, you wind up playing as few gigs as possible and subbing out the rest. I was like, this is fascinating. I'm like, so you have your career is that you are the first call sub for, you know, guitar one at Wiccan. He's like, yeah, that's exactly right. And, um, it's just, it was a fascinating thing to me to think that his full-time job is that he's a sub. The The way the union works, I think the chairholder has to play 51% of the shows in any given quarter. Uh, but I got the feeling that there were ways to like sort of even massage that, that are, that are sort of copacetic within the way the union pulls everything together. To be a sub though... Not only do you have to know the show and be recommended, of course, by the chairholder and ultimately the chairholder is responsible if, you know, you screw things up, but you also have to be approved by the conductor for the show. So mm -hmm. it's not like the chairholder can just say, well, you know, I got Timmy coming in tonight. Bye. It's like, no, no. Who's Timmy? You know, what can he play? Introduce me to him. I will let you know if that's going to be all right. Right. So once you get approved for, to be a sub for a Broadway show, it, it's it's not a it's a no, it's not a non-trivial process, right? So once you're there, you're kind of there, um, and it's it's fascinating. You you can make it it. There's this thing on uh, with pit musicians where th there's a a flat rate uh, per week, right? And you divide it by eight shows, and and that's you know what you're getting paid per show, but it's a flat rate per week, plus the, the union rate, so scale. Plus, you get uh, what they call doubles. You don't get double the rate, uh, but you get. And I, I found an article from like 2018, so the prices are higher now. But it was like 18, almost 1,900 bucks a week for just a you know the the, the scale rate. Do eight shows, unless you're playing more than one instrument. And then you start to earn what's called doubles. And most pit musicians are playing more than one instrument. You've seen you know, a, a reed player that's going to play not just clarinet, but also maybe oboe and bassoon, right? Because the parts yep. don't happen at the same time. Well, that would be two doubles that that person's getting. The first double in 2018 earned another almost 300 bucks a week. The second and, and subsequent doubles uh, earn half of that, like 150 bucks a week. So it really starts to add this up. Andy was telling me about a, a show that he had heard of where the musicians were on stage. And so not only do you get doubles for, okay, well, you're playing, you know, electric guitar, acoustic guitar, whatever. You're now getting a, a double for uh, being on stage. You're getting a double for makeup, for costuming and for choreography. And so I, this was a, the, the show he was telling me about it was a hundred minute show, a one act show post tax. The musicians would clear like 500 bucks per performance for, you know, less than two hours of their time all in, right? Maybe a little more than two hours of your time because you got to show up, you got to get into costume, you got to, you know, do the whole thing. But but still, like, you know, there's good money. Now you got to live in Manhattan, but living in Manhattan can be done economically if you know, you know, the you don't live in Midtown, you don't live on the, you know, the Upper East Side or whatever. Um, but, uh, but I just found, right? yeah, what's that? You could live economically in Manhattan. These days people can, yeah. Really? Mm-hmm. I'm surprised to hear that. I know. Yeah. No, my friend, my friend, although, although my friend, my assumptions Andy, have clearly been thrown uh, in the window. So. Well, my friend Andy is, uh, you know, both he and his wife work, but, but they live, um, 
in Manhattan on the on the Upper West Side, I believe. And his job is exactly what I just described to you. And I don't know what his wife mm-hmm. does, but um, it's like being a backup quarterback. What's that? Yeah, it's like being a backup quarterback. I yeah, mean, you're except you're, you're that you're paid pl- because if there's an emergency, you're really needed, and so they got to have a good person in place. It's yeah, like, but he's playing a- the gigs. Like, I mean, he's playing half the gigs is what's happening. He's playing as many gigs as the other guy is essentially contractually allowed to farm out and still retain his right. his chair, right? Because that's yeah. the whole thing is you hold that chair as long as you can. You you fatten up your pension. Obviously, you're earning some money throughout it as well. You control the whole widget. But the idea is, you know, you 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 sort of keep it. And then my guess is, assuming Wicked keeps its run on Broadway, and of course, you know, sometimes shows end, even popular ones. Phantom of the Opera, I think, is ending early or mid next year. But, uh, you know, you just you just like you keep it and it would I'm, I, like if they if he were to decide to retire right now, my friend Andy would would then become the chairholder. You know, it would right. like there's there's it would be insanity to to like bring someone else in. It's like, no, this guy's actually already in. Everybody knows him. It's he's part of the family there. Right. So you just keep it going. But it's just fascinating to me that, you know, he is a full time professional sub. And that's what he did when he was on Rock of Ages too uh, years ago. And I didn't under, when he explained it to me back then, I was like, well, OK, but you were just subbing like I, I, I didn't I didn't assign the weight to it that I now understand should have been assigned to to it. You know, yeah. it's like now I understand why he was so frustrated up here because he had experienced what it was like to actually make a living as a pit music, as a musician, right. With a steady gig. And I mean, you have to be able to play that, you know, that goes without saying with a conversation like this. And Andy is a spectacular player. He can play anything. I've watched him sight read stuff. I mean, you know, you got to have the chops, but there's a lot of people that have the chops that can't make it their job. And, and he did. And then he was here trying to do the same thing and just crashing into walls uh, because the opportunity is different here than it is in Manhattan. No great surprise saying it out loud like that. But I, again, I just didn't, I didn't understand it until the last 24 hours or so. It was like, Oh, you know, what's cool about that story is I'm reminded that, that musicians, even at the highest level, a working musician works, right? I remember seeing, yes. Uh, moving out the Billy Joel musical. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, saw it on, on Broadway and there were two guys who I recognized from Billy Joel's band in the pit orchestra. <laughs> guys yeah. got to work, right? Guy, got, you got to work. Guys got to work. Yes. You know, if you're not on tour, what are you doing? You know, and, and, uh, one of the guys for the house rockers, well, he has subbed for the house rockers and contributed some charts to us. You know, when, he he's a horn player. He's a trumpet player. He goes out and he tours with Huey Lewis and he tours with the Doobie brothers. Yeah. And you know, that that's a great gig, but when that's not happening, what are you doing to put food on the table? Right. It's just, it is fascinating that, you know, someone who could be on a stage in front of 20,000 people, 50,000 people the next day, you know, could be playing at your local bar. It's one of the more fascinating things, humbling, you know, when you think about when you get a gig, the types of people who would, who would, who would take that gig. Right. Yeah. So when, you know, when we talk about musicians, not taking, you know, I'll do it for free or, you know, I'll do it, you know, to show off for my wife, my girlfriend, or, you know, I do it for the love of playing. You are reminded that, you know, working musicians who invest in their, in their profession constantly and reach the highest levels to continue to earn a living you know, they will do something else, including pit orchestras as a, evidently a fairly lucrative, nice, steady thing. You sleep in your own bed, you know, is not a bad way to go if you can get that type of work. Yes. Yeah. It's, it, it's not a, no one sees that as failure, right? That is, that no. is the success working, to which you aspire. Working. Yeah, absolutely. That's a regular gig. That's, that's a regular paycheck. And a good paycheck, I, you yeah. know? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. It, it's interesting. The first, I'm trying to think, maybe it wasn't the first show I did with Andy, but I, I did a production of Spring Awakening at Seacoast Rep a number of years ago. And 
it was the first show I did with my friend, my now friend, Julius. Um, it was the first show I did with, was it the first show I did with Victor? No, it wasn't. Bitter Pill was the first show I did with Victor. Um, my friend JM was in that show. And obviously Andy was in that show. All four of those people from that one production uh, have all gone off to do things on Broadway. And it was just mm. fascinating thinking about it the other night. It was like, wait, you know, Julius is on the road with the touring production of Hairspray. JM was in the touring production of Rock of Ages. He played Lonnie. Julius is the the conductor piano one uh, with uh, with hairspray. Victor is about he's not on Broadway yet, but there's that whole Karate Kid thing happening, and I, I as I understand it, he's still very much involved with that, and I think that will break to Broadway if you know if the if if the heavens smile the right way. But it's just fascinating that it's like wow, you know, there was a lot of talent and and driven yeah. people. I mean, it, you know, you if you sit around and wait for things to happen, they don't. I I know, I, I know I'm. I, I know, I know you know that, <laughs> but, um, but you know, you go out and you, you, you do things and you keep making, you keep pushing forward and, and right. it's fascinating what, you know, watching these people like go and soar. It's awesome. That's great. You know what else is a really coveted pro gig that pays well? What's that? Church gigs. Oh yeah. Some of the musicians yeah. that I know. I always thought that church bands were like, you know, an at will collection of whoever happens to belong to the church, but no churches hire musicians invest in sound systems. I mean, big churches, certainly though, you know, I have one friend who does, who does sound every Sunday as a, as a regular gig Yeah, it makes a good lit, you know, it's a good payday. And I think, yeah, I, mean, I think that's what that Dan East, um, who's been on this show and written into this show many, many times. Uh, he's a sound engineer and a drummer, but I, I think a good chunk of his, sound engineer work is uh with churches in his area yeah yeah it's yeah it's it is, a, that's it a good gig. thing yeah when you're a musician and you know you know how much effort goes into being at the top of your craft right yep you, you know one of the things that you observe in music is that people can reach a passable level you know with a passable amount of effort Yes. But to really become, you know, great, yeah, X amount of it is in, innate talent, but there's far more people than those who have innate talent who just, it is their life, and they have invested their 10,000 hours to be great in it. And then, so you know that, you know what it takes to do that. And then you realize that it's a, it's a hard life to make a living in. And you see the places where those people go, where they gravitate to, to to put together a living pit orchestras, churches. Yeah. I mean, interesting places. It's not about bar gigs. It's rarely no, about bar gigs. No, my, I, I hadn't thought about this and I don't think I've ever shared this with you or shared it on the show, but my first, like the gig that, that in my mind made me a professional musician, AKA the first time I got paid to play music was a church yeah. gig. Uh, I got, I remember getting paid a hundred bucks my band director referred me a church had called up the high school, you know, the local high school and was like, we need somebody to play timpani, uh, like, you know, on Sunday morning for our service. And he's like, Hey man, do you want to make a hundred bucks? And I'm like, what? Like, bucks. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I, I'm lucky to make that today in a club. Right. But, uh, he's like, yeah. I'm like, Sh yeah. What, what, like, what, what, wait, wait, you know, what, what do I have to do? Uh, and he's like, yeah, just go down. He's like, they, they have drums there. Just, you know, Go down and play. I'm like, how long do I have to play for to make a hundred bucks? He's like, oh, I think you play for 40 minutes. And I'm like, seriously? He's like, yeah, you mind getting up early on a Sunday morning? I'm like, I'll stay up all night on Saturday night. Like, dude, it's a hundred bucks. I was, I was maybe 15 years old. I mean, I think my, I don't think I had my license yet. I think my dad had to drive me down there or something. I'm like, dad, they want to, they want to pay me a hundred bucks. He's like, what? Like, <laughs> he was shocked, you know, but yeah, yeah, that was it. That was, that was the thing that, that changed me from rank amateur to rank amateur that gets paid. So, you know, I'll do it. Yeah, that'll do it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 And it was, I, I felt like I was stealing money from the church when they gave me the hundred bucks. It's like, is this really okay? Like, they're like, yeah. Like, sweet. I think they're going to be okay. I think they're going to be okay. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, I, I understand more about the church now. I, I don't, it's all good. Like, but it was. But again, the, you know, the business models thing is a reminder that, yeah. that, you know, big, big endeavors are big businesses. You know, like when my yes. friend Brad, you know, he was on retainer with Rush. Right. Meaning, 
you know, he would take a gig elsewhere, but if Rush called, that's for, you know, you're on retainer, you drop things and that's, that's understood with whoever you may have in the, in the interim. And, you know, they can afford to do that to have people in the same way that a Broadway show yeah. is going to be picky. And, you know, we'll have a deep bench because the show must go on at a certain quality. No, no question. mark. It's kind of like Adam in the van band, right? Yep. He's, he's, he's preparing for all eventualities. Yes, that's right. Yes, exactly. Right. You, you, you have subs. In fact, last night, the woman who played Alphaba in, uh, in the show, which is the, the wicked witch, the green witch, uh, she, she was the, she's not the understudy. The term was the standby, uh, which, mm. I, which is, uh, it, 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 as I understand it in the hierarchy there above the understudy, that, that person is like, they're ready to go, all, you know, good to go all the time. Yeah. And, uh, and it was, you know, it was a Monday night. It was a weird night. Most of the time they're off. And so there were a couple of the standbys that were in roles that, uh, that would normally, you know, who the chair is someone else. And mm -hmm. she was, it was Alyssa Fox who uh, played Elphaba. She was a star. I mean, I can't imagine that the other person is better than her. They, they, they've been doing it longer. And like, you know, I, I don't mean to say they don't deserve their spot. Like, that's fine. But she, we will see more from her for sure. She was freaking amazing. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't realize until after the show that she was the, you know, the standby or whatever. And I was like, what? She was freaking amazing. It was awesome. Mm. You know, the other thing that was amazing, the sound I, I, I've seen lots of Broadway, uh, lead a charmed life. And, and I actually enjoyed the, the play last night or the musical. I, I, I generally don't care for musical theater, but I really liked it. Um, the sound was crystal clear and not too quiet, but quiet. Like yeah. when one person was singing and we were in, we bought tickets day of, uh, we did get Andy staff rate tickets. Thank you, Andy, you rock. Uh, but there weren't many seats available. Like when we said we went at 10 AM when the box office opened yesterday morning and the woman, and I was there with Andy and the woman at the, at the box office was like, um, you want three seats together. The, the only one I have together is in the second to last row of the balcony. And Andy's like, you know, those seats aren't terrible. She's like, but I have singles down on the left side of the orchestra. And it was like, well, yeah, that's fine. I mean, you know, like we're not going to talk to each other while the show goes on anyway, you know, it's fine. So we all sat, we each sat alone. Uh, so I was, I was in row L. So, you know, very close to the stage and great view was fine. Uh, in fact, I was on the left aisle of row L. So, you know, t arguably a quote unquote bad seat, but it wasn't. When one person was singing, decibels were about 75, which was like, at first it was like, wow, this is quiet. And I was like, actually, this is great. When that, that, that's, You actually measured it? or Yeah, my, app, my or? Apple watch um, measures it now. And I, I just keep the, the DB meter on my my watch is home screen. Cause I'm always curious. Uh, and so, and, and it's, I mean, I've actually measured it against a, a calibrated DB meter and it's really close. I'm, I'm shocked. Well, not, maybe not that shocked. Apple's pretty good at, at what Apple does, but, uh, you know, it was, it was like 75, uh, when one person was singing, when the ensemble was singing, you know, every, everybody kind of, you know, gang vocals is the wrong term. When the ensemble was singing, it was maybe 83, 84, which is also still really like relatively quiet, safe hearing levels, really good. There were maybe three or four times where it peaked at, at 90. And I know what 90 feels like to my ears. And I confer, you know, I looked at it on my watch. I was like, wow, that, okay. That, that kind of got like a little shrieky and loud. And it was like, oh yeah, it's cause it's at 90. All right, fine. But it never got above 90 or 91. I go see shows locally here. And they baseline at 90, you know, like theater shows, which shouldn't, you know, um, and then they're peaking at a hundred, which is freaking like, I'm, I've got, if, if something's baselined at 90, I've got earplugs in at 75. I didn't need earplugs. It was totally fine. So I was really impressed with that. I, the pit was a standard proscenium stage. The pit was in its, you know, traditional location, open pit, uh, right in, in front of the stage. But I'm pretty sure based on what Andy said and, and also the based on how the sound was in the room that 
the the drums were in you know three three hundred sixty degrees of plexiglass, uh, so that they could really control it. There were there were no live cymbals or snare drum in that room. It was you know it was all well controlled, which is pretty typical on Broadway these days. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, but I mean, it, the, the sound was, it was spectacular. It was no, it, you know, when you, when you're running 75, 80 decibels, you're really not fighting the weird resonance of the room or anything. Not that the room isn't, you know, fairly well tuned to begin with, but you're just not going to run into that. All those weird reflections when you're only at 75 or 80 dB, it's, you know, it's what comes out of the speakers and then you're kind of done. And so you, you really keep them a, a really good level of control. I was impressed. Uh, there was a lot. A lot going on that, that blew me away. And the conductor was was spectacular to watch. Dan Machichi, I think uh, I'm pronouncing his name wrong, but but he was that that show is not tracked to a click. It is it is done on the stick. And um, as I understand it, if if things are if the actors are dragging, they might pick up the tempo a little bit sometimes. But, you know, that's just a guess. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, it was good. It was a fascinating thing. Yeah. So turns out every now and then. I enjoy musical theater. So. Go figure. Go figure. Ah, what else we got today? I played a fling gig. We played an acoustic gig. Speaking of manageable sound levels on Saturday night at the freedom cafe, which is a, a local place here in Durham that, um, they, 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 all of their proceeds go to fund or to fight human trafficking. And mm. we played an acoustic set there, which for fling means Russ, was on an acoustic guitar. Jamie played an acoustic bass. Aaron could have played an acoustic piano. And the next time we play there, he will. There's because there is an, a grand piano on stage. He wound up using, he got a new Nord keyboard that he wound up using for this gig that worked well. And then Mike, I was on my pitch slap, of course, which is a wearable cajon. And then uh, Mike played his electric guitar. And that, that blend really works for us. Uh, when we have, when we have to, or choose to do these acoustic gigs. And this was a choice. We didn't, we could have played full electric in this room, but we sort of decided it might work better. And it was, it was nice to be able to just hear, you know, every, everybody kind of in the air and keep the sound levels really manageable, get all the harmonies blended. It was, and people liked it. it was, and it was nice because we had just played a gig last weekend where we played full electric. So it was nice to kind of offer this contrast and, bring the same people out to hear much of the same songs. I think we, we played all originals again. I, I think we probably had three songs different between last weekend's set and this weekend's set. Um, but, you know, mixing it up and playing it acoustic kind of makes everything, it highlights different elements of the songs, which is fun. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, that's good. You play any gigs this week? You said you, you, you pre-show, I think you said you didn't, right? I did not have any gigs this week. It's actually quite slow and I'm kind of, I'm keenly aware. Um, the house rockers have, are, are booked well into next year. Yeah. The amount of time that I'm, I've allocated for it, but it, it feels at least to me now, like the phone isn't ringing as much as it used to. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out, Hmm. Is that a cause or an effect, right? Is, is like, has word gotten around that I'm not around as much it has, you know, I, it does seem like there's a lot more bands that have come out of COVID. There's a lot more bands that are out there. Yep. And so, so I'm glad that we are well on the way to filling up the amount of time that I've allocated to it. So, which is, you know, one long weekend in the winter and two, two weekends in the summer. Sure. And we have, I think, I think in August we might be playing three, three weekends, which would be multiple gigs in a weekend. But, you know, I worry about everything. And so I, I worry if I should <laughs> interpolate, you know, some meaning for this. Although clearly my my ability to, <laughs> to project data is is challenged as we started this episode. Sure. Yeah, I, th I think that's probably true of all of us. You know, we we, we project based on our our presumptions, our prejudices and the 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 anecdotal set of information that we get. As, as my friend Kelly Gamont, I think, you know, Kelly uh, often likes to say. The plural of anecdote is not data. So <laughs> she is not wrong, by the way. <laughs> so it's very true. It's yeah. also your, you know, your worldview. You're so, you're so sure you're, you're right. It takes a lot to move you off of, of, of your, your perspective on things. Yeah. You have to be really willing to look at things again. You know, we have a good schedule of very good gigs that most bands would be, you know, happy to have. 
but in my in my memory the phone was ringing constantly and i and i was turning down <laughs> yeah, which yeah. Is, you know probably not quite true but but it but it it sure seems like it today yes. looking back over my shoulder yes yes that makes yeah right you you right we we craft a a historical narrative and historical narrative because i i like that version of our our grammar um uh, but it is not necessarily correct yeah right yeah 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 so. but that i mean you said you worry about everything and and as, as your friend i can say yeah I, I know i know you as a worrier i i'm that way too i mean it it, it um at at a manageable level worrying about things can be helpful because it can provide that fuel to go and and drive you forward um uh, obviously Great. if it becomes paralyzing worry that's not good um and hopefully if 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 it gets to that point for any of us we we find somebody to talk to about it and and work through it but but a little you know a little bit of that worry i remember at some at some point um a friend was like oh have you ever tried ativan would you uh you know i think that'd be really good for you and i'm like no that stuff scares me they're like why I'm like because like my that level of of worry whatever you want to call it is what fuels me i like I, i'm pretty sure that's the reason i don't have to yeah. live in a cardboard box but, you like, know, that's also your worldview your worldview exactly. is that that's what makes you effective is that you use that right exactly but whether that really gets you a result you don't you know you i have don't to look at it more i don't know the answer correct i yeah, yeah. It, it, this person may be absolutely right that ativan would be really good for me <laughs> but i but i'm here's the here's the funny you know the ironic part I'm afraid to find out. So yeah, because you know, yeah. it served you so well to this point. So far, right? I have a, I have this this historical evidence to support that I that it's that the current path is good for me most of the time. What you don't know is that if you'd taken a different path, whether you would have even better success, wild that's success. You know. I get the yeah. hell out of no, my no. own way. Yeah. No, yeah. oh, I mean, and and that's certainly true. I. Uh, I, I'm I'm the one that's in my own way most often. So yeah, yep. that's probably true for all of us, but it's certainly true for me and I'll project it onto all of you. And I sorry, sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for the therapy session, folks. I appreciate it. There we go. Yep. We got anything else, Mr. Kent, or are we good to go? I'm for good, this week? Mr. Hamilton. All right. I am very good for the week. Are we, um, are we do, I know we have one scheduled for next week, but, but should we, should we skip that and, and come back? Um, what what are we what are we doing here? Yeah, we had one week that we we're going to skip and we we're going to record and and put it out at different times. So. Yeah, well, we might not be here next one, week. At least one more. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. All right, sweet. Thanks for hanging out with us, folks. Feedback at giggabpodcast dot com. And uh, gosh, I always forget. You know, this is that thing. Maybe the maybe the out of him would help. But what is the uh, what is that thing that I always forget every week, Paul? Oh, that would be always be performing. That's the one. Later!